I'd like to call the Blackstone Millville Regional District School Committee meeting for October 24th, 2019 to order. Could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we can do our introduction of members. Yeah. Jack Keefe, Blackstone. Jacob Chaplin, student representative. Tammy Lemmy, Blackstone. Tara Larkin, Millville. Wendy Greenstein, Blackstone. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. Okay, um, report from our student representative. So we'll start off with the athletics report. So cross country is one win and three losses. Field hockey is two and 15. Football is four and two. Boys soccer is four and 10. Girls soccer is five and 10. And volleyball is seven and 11. And these past two weeks were all of the senior games for all of the sports. So those consisted of just celebrations for the seniors to recognize their hard work across the past four years for the teams. And it's, that means a lot for a lot of the seniors that participate in those sports. Um, so updates on student organizations. Student Council this week is the week of recognition where we're recognizing different aspects of our town-wide community for their hard work. So each day coordinates with a different theme of a positive community, and we have a different aspect of our community rec we recognize. So yesterday we recognized um, the teachers, and at lunches had like students write on sticky notes, compliments, and favorite memories with their teachers, and they're being put on a poster for the teachers' doors. And then we also did a community cleanup yesterday, so we went to like six different locations around town and did a cleanup. And we got like, I think like 15 trash bags full of trash from that oh. yesterday, so that was really successful. Um, in two weeks is our first um, leadership conference that we'll be attending. We're going to be sending 25 delegates to the CDMASC leadership conference that will be hosted at BVT this year. That's an after school event on November 7th. Um, another project that we just started working on yesterday is a mock leadership conference where we're going to expose the middle schoolers to leadership. Um, like different leadership st styles and strategies and different things of good leaders and expose them to them at an early age so they understand what that's like at the high school level. Um, tonight, well, last week we also brought 250 bags of candy to the foster care center for foster kids Halloween party, which is tonight, which is where Cassie's at volunteering tonight. And then NHS, their field trip was today to do a bonding team building event for them today. It was really fun. It was at the Harmony Hill Ropes course. And then they're also running their Boo a Friend project this week. And what is that? That's basically, it's like, it's kind of like candy grams where you um, go up to the lunch, at the lunch table and like buy um, a bag of candy to be sent to your friend and boo them on Halloween. So it's just a cute little thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's fun. Excellent. Any questions? I have one question. Yeah. Um, is any of the leadership, um, like student council or national, do they ever go down to the elementary schools um, to share their experience in a leadership role? Um, I know we haven't in the past, and we've always thought about doing projects like that, which is why we're doing a mock leadership conference for the middle school this mm -hmm. year. We, could, we might expand that to the elementary school, but I know we haven't planned it yet, but we could. Mm -hmm. All right. I just I remember when student council came down when I was in elementary school and it was a big deal to see, you know, the older kids come down and, you know, share their experiences mm -hmm. and, you know, the elementary kids always look up to them at least, you know, the upper elementary yeah. that know, you know, where they're going. Yeah. Um I just always wondered if they continued that or Yeah. Uh, I feel like that'd be a great project that we can take into account for later in the year. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we're going to skip around a little bit tonight, and Jane should be here very shortly, so um, we can't take any votes, but we can certainly have conversations. So um, we'll skip over um, Consent Agenda A, but we will have a public forum if anybody would like to come forward in the public forum. No? Okay. So we're going to um, skip down to the report of the business office. Terrific. Good evening, everyone. I brought a few special guests this evening to talk about some of the uh, ongoing financial reporting that has been happening. Um, I'd like to start with our auditors. We have with us uh, Robert Brown and Sean DeSorcy to go over the FY18 
end of the year audit. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Bob Brown. This is Sean DeSorcy. No, hi. Sean was the uh, audit manager on site uh, for the audit. Um, as part of the audit, we produced two documents. Uh, the largest one is the financial statements with our opinion on the financial statements. Uh, the second is a uh, federal grant audit report. Um, since the district receives over $750,000 in federal aid, it's required to have a audit of the federal grants. Um, so uh, the one thing on the audit and the financial statements I wanted to um, emphasize is there was a significant change in accounting standards last year for post-employment benefits, the health insurance expense uh, liability that, that the district has for it's um, uh, employees when they retire and their current uh, retirees. Uh, in the past, it, uh, about 10 years ago, there was no liability on the books. And the, an audit standard came in and said, we're going to phase it in over 30 years like the, they were phasing in the pension liability at the time. A couple of years ago, the, they changed their minds and the pension liability, 100% of it came on the books in one year. Uh, we went over that at a prior audit report. And since they changed that standard, they said we got to do the same thing for post-employment benefits. So fiscal 18, the entire liability for post-employment benefits came on the books instead of being phased in. On page 50 of the larger report. Matt, can you just clarify for us what yep, it's called? Because it didn't match yep, what the larger, you said. The larger report is the report on examination of basic financial statements. And you said page 50? Page 50, yes. The top section of that page, you'll see that um, at the beginning of the year, your net position was $863,442. The prior period adjustment that we had to put through for the post-employment benefits liability was $17,723,000. So it drove the net position of the district into a large negative position. This is not unusual. Same standard change for every local government in the state or nation. Um, uh, it does not affect your bond rating because the bonding uh, people always knew this liability was there. They always knew an estimate of it. It just wasn't on the books, but it was always taken into account when you had a bond rating. Um, so the, this will affect you in the future at some point because governments will start to differentiate themselves as to how they address this large liability. Those that do well with it will at some point have a better bond rating compared to those that don't. Um, psychologically, it would be good to start an OPEB trust fund uh, and attempt to, to fund it so uh, you can <coughs> show an effort to address the liability. Uh, uh, we have uh, several school districts and several towns as clients. The school districts are in a tougher position in addressing this issue. You know, the town governments have other funding sources, you know, whether it be water and sewer enterprise funds and light plants and um, uh, budgetarily they're in a better position to uh, to address it as opposed to um, typically two town school districts which you know, we're fighting for funding just to get the education product that they want. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, you know, the big thing is that you're in the same position as everyone else. So it looks like a very big number, and it is a big number. Um, the only other way to reduce that would be looking at your policy and, and the benefits you provide. You know, some places have uh, tweaked that and been able to lower their liability. Uh, but that affects, you know, changing benefits. You know. Okay. 
that's a major item I wanted to mention. The, the statement that looks more normal to users um, is on page 13. There's a balance sheet that has a general fund. Uh, obviously, the districts operate off of their general fund fund balance and the uh, amount that certified by the state to be able to use to go forward. Uh, this is not full accrual with all the liabilities for pension and debt um, or post-employment benefits. This is more of a cash basis presentation of your general fund. And the total fund balance at the end of 18 was 581000 Obviously, as a budget-driven entity, this is um, the general fund fund balance is what's more important to you as to what's available each year to use for the next next budget cycle. Um, the smaller report um, says independent auditor's report as required by uniform guidance and government auditing standards. This is on page uh, for that report, it lists the federal aid spending that uh, the district had for fiscal 18. Um, it's all Department of Education plus uh, Department of Agriculture, which handles the school lunch program. There was one finding. It's a continuing finding from the prior year. Um, there was a change in how the um, expenditures were being charged to the grants a couple of years ago, which didn't give a good accurate information on how much the district could draw down periodically for the, for the particular grants. Um, uh, that policy's now been changed back to the original policy of, of direct charging, so you always know where you're at. The prior policy was charging things to the general fund and then doing a group reclassification later and that interfered with accurate drawdowns for each grant on a periodic basis which is part of what we have to test so th that policy has been changed back to um, direct charging everything to the grants at the time of the expenditure so uh, that you know uh, should disappear over time the, you know, the policies went into effect, I think, in late, late fiscal 18 and um, into, uh, was into fiscal 19 at the time. Um, other than that, I'm open for questions. Okay. So um, just as an update regarding um, <coughs> practice so there was an issue with as Bob mentioned charging charging to the general fund and then just putting in an adjustment to the grant as opposed to regularly charging the actual grant account line um, when I came in somewhat into FY 19 we tried to we tried to address that um, there still may be a finding in, in 19 as well. Um, but as I've discussed with both Bob and Sean, the significance of that finding would be pretty uh, significantly lessened. So it's not, it, it shouldn't be as glaring. And eventually, that finding will come off of, off of our reports. And the hope will be we'll have absolutely no findings. Um, another thing. I wanted to mention is again this is back to the 2018 <laughs> audit mm -hmm. when we began last year Dr. DeFalco <coughs> and I uh, we were on the FY17 audit the FY17 audit was approximately a year and seven months behind schedule the FY18 audit is less than a year behind schedule and we already have on the books to begin the work for the FY19 audit which we are anticipating we will have due in time for the March 30th deadline so we're trying to pick up Catch speed up. it's kind of been yeah. audit to audit to audit <laughs> <coughs> but in the same people are going to do the next audit so they <coughs> sort of just are able to pick up where they left off correct. and not start over yes correct 
May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Um, for OPEB, w is there a, a general recommendation of how to sort of get get this number to be reduced? You know, is there? Well, yeah. To reduce it, you have to start a an OPEB trust. Okay. Uh, and you have to put money in that trust, and then that offsets the liability. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of governments are struggling with it. There, there may be only 10 percent that are doing really well at it um, the other then there's about 70 percent that are doing something and the rest have nothing at, at this point and um, uh, I think we have one school district that started a trust yeah one is going to start one next year um, and the others don't have one right now all of our towns um, I think all but one have already started for several years but uh -huh. even they are in trouble a little bit because if you got a hundred thousand dollars in your trust for a 15 million dollar liability it's right it's, so mm -hmm. not much different than nothing but psychologically it at least shows you started something. It's, it's a sign of goodwill I, yeah. I feel like having a trust might even be a start <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I mean that's we that's been brought up to us a number of times mm -hmm. yes I mean this yep. is mr. Watson on the finance yes. committee's Big conversation since it came into existence so and dr. DeFalco and I have discussed um, looking into that further and possibly bringing it to the committee to, to see what what the decision would be whether or not we wanted to try to start one I, I think we have to we have to start at some somewhere. point right I mean it, it's great that it's not it, it's not impacting bond rating today but if the projection is that it's going to at some point, mm -hmm. then, you know, mm -hmm. sure. every little bit counts, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to his point that that 17 million is not going anywhere too quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. A negative. Yes. But definitely something to get going. The, the key on addressing is also getting it into your regular operating budget. Yeah. As opposed to, we do an <clears throat> article one year, but not one the next then right yeah, towns are more prone to that because they you know time meaning of a dozen articles the districts more are based on the uh, overall <coughs> budget anyway but sure thank you any other questions thank you thank you thanks so much thank you very thank much. you thank you so much A clarifying question mm -hmm. maybe to you I'm not sure That's fine. but if you if you develop this trust and this might not be something and and to his point about the towns you know for people who are going to the towns directly versus doing it through your regional budget would would each town have to put in the same amount or would it be proportional it would, or I, I would imagine it would be proportional mm -hmm. okay. if it went directly I mean, not to that the I'm towns. thinking that's the way to go I'm just it would it, it would district, and if we and if work. we put it into the operating budget it again would just be split uh, at the proportional level between the towns okay is it oped with a d or a b opeb b. with a b i had it written it's both other ways. it's <laughs> other po it's other post employment benefits, benefits. liability okay. Awesome. Thank you. So the yeah. L is and I, I have it both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, yellow the L is si silent. The L, L is silent. silent. <laughs> we hope to L. keep it that way. For, a long time. for anybody watching that heard the liability word but didn't hear the L. <laughs> I bought I picked that. <laughs> Stay right where you are. Stay right where you are. Okay. Hi, Jane. Hey, Jane. You're still oh, Yep. Well, I'll wait for Jane to get seated. Keep going. Keep and going. Then, uh, keep going. Just so next, uh, next on my report, we have another guest. Um, with us tonight, we have Ron Pierre Louis, who is our contracted assistant treasurer, who works okay. on behalf of this board. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, Ron. Thank you. And uh, Ron is going to discuss some of the FY19 end of the year wrap up procedures and then a little bit about what he has been working on and what he does for the district, and then talk a bit about um, the first quarter reconciliation. No, I Good evening, it. school committee members. Again, my name is Ron Pierre-Louis. Uh, back in April, 
I was contracted to come in and perform assistant treasurer duties. And um, I just wanted to come in and formally introduce myself and quickly just go down a, a, a short checklist of the things that I've done and the services I'll continue to provide. Um, again, one part of my services, I come in and I perform the monthly bank reconciliations. Um, that includes looking at you know, the bank statements and looking at the bank balances of the school's accounting records. Um, typically in uh, school districts, that's something a, the treasurer is supposed to perform. So I prepare it on behalf of the treasurer. I email it to the treasurer, have her take a look at it, and she's okay. She doesn't have any questions. She signs off on it. So I don't have a copy of the packet. Um, can I, okay. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, but if you look at the last page, it's called Cash Reconciliation, September 30th, 2019. Um, on a quarterly basis, the school committee should expect to see um, this report, which basically details what the um, what the cash balance is on that specific September 30th date or quarter ending date. And at September 30th, you could see the um, cash balance is at 5.3. And um, there's a detail there of how that's broken off by fund. In addition to that, I have uh, provide the um, support for the annual audit. So when the auditors come in, they email over a checklist of a laundry list of items that they want to see between payroll records, vouchers, checks, and so on and so forth. And I help coordinate to put all that stuff in a package and get it off to them, including the books and records. Now, I act as a point person, so when they have questions, they'll forward it to me. And <coughs> if I can answer it, great. Um, if not, I'll lean on Matt or somebody else in the accounting department to, to get it. Um, I kind of alleviate that uh, frustration off the shoulders of the folks in the accounting department because they have a lot on their plate anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I do that for them. Also, what I do is I provide um, um, aid to the closeout at the end of the year. Again, like Matt mentioned before, um, the FY19 um, figures are closed and we're ready to move on that. Um, that took a process to get the numbers finalized, all the adjustments in, and everything rolled over to the next fiscal year. So that has been done and we actually already have a package ready for the auditors. Information has already been given to the auditors. So hopefully by March 31st or way before March 31st, everything will be finalized and they'll be here again a lot earlier presenting you with their results. Okay. Um, in addition to that, two things that uh, Matt and I have been working on and will continue to, well, we have worked on and we've completed are the end of the year report and the um, E and D reporting. So on page one and page two, what you have here is a, it's called the cash reconciliation. It's more of a reconciliation between the school's books and the report that the treasurer would submit to DOR or that you're gonna start seeing every quarter. Um, so essentially the treasurer's responsibilities is a separate from the accounting department. So what they wanna make sure is that whatever numbers that the treasurer calculates agrees to what the school has. And DOR expects that to be um, certified and sent over to them. And that's what that first page is. The second page is the actual treasurer's calculation of the uh, cash balance. And again, um, there were no differences between the two. And again, that has to be certified by both the treasurer and the uh, business office and sent over to the Department of, of Revenue. They are different. They are different. The, uh, well, page if you. Page one and page two. Oh, no, page one and page three. Oh, oh, oh. Page oh. three <laughs> is the actual total. 
Yep, that matches. <laughs> okay. People almost had a heart attack. <laughs> Sorry. How did I just starting on page two? <laughs> yeah, it's not on page two. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's um, so that's one part of the uh, the uh, submission. Then, if you look at page five. <laughs> so the third to the last page. This is the E and D balance sheet that we completed, and it's supposed to be sent in the DOR. And this is the balance sheet they use to calculate what our E and D is for 2019. And um, the number that uh, you should pay attention to is in the first column, and the third number up under undesignated fund balance. For 750. Okay. So that's the number we're we're um, assuming they should come up to when they do their calculation, and that's what the uh, the um, the school will have. That's about a um, close to a hundred thousand dollar, maybe a hundred and twenty thousand um, dollar increase mm -hmm. from um, the prior year, and again, it's subject to. Um, DOR's calculation, sometimes they might have some changes, adjustments, some ins and outs, but for the most part, um, we think that's a, a solid number and that's what we're going to end up as for 2019. Um, you go to the next page. This is the actual um, calculation. And the way it works is you start off with your beginning fund balance, so the 2018 undesignated fund balance. Um, you back back in and out any uh, encumbrances and reserves that the uh, school may have or the district may have. And then based on that, um, and then you also back out the current year um, operating results. So then at the end of the day, you should come out to, you end up coming out to um, that last line, current year undesignated fund balance. So now, the, um, if that amount ever gets above 20% of the school's operating budget? No, five. I mean, oh, 5%. 5%. Five percent. Percent. Yeah, yeah. There's so many, yeah. One twentieth. Yes, 5%. Then, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if they ask for a check or what they is. Or <laughs> most likely, they'll tell you to do something with it or something. But, you know, that, but mm -hmm. right now, you're well under that point. We're right about 2%, right? Hmm? Are we about 2%? Is that right, Matt? Is that what I read? It's quote, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's about, yeah. It's about, yep. yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah, any, any funds that are over 5% in the next budgeting season would need to be applied to offset the contributions oh, the from town. the towns. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I was aware of. Now, is, is this, could at any point we use this to start our OPEB, OPEB trust? That was actually a conversation that Ron and I were having earlier, oh. and um, I need to check into that um, with DLS just to yeah. make sure that it's one of the approved uses <coughs> of E and D. Um, we do have some. I know Dr. DeFalco and I have discussed um, some possible capital projects that would be coming from there. I know that the committee recently approved the use of fifty thousand dollars of the END once it's certified mm -hmm. to to um, design and build that secure vestibule at the high school but uh, I, I I believe that that is a possibility but I want to make sure that it's an accepted governmental use of the END. and I think the follow-up to that is then what what's the process to do that do we go to the towns or is it so anytime we and D's that we yeah. get to Yep. So anytime we use E and D, we can only use E and D in a window. So after it's been certified and prior to the close of that fiscal year is when we can use E and D, and we can we can plan on using it um, in advance. So once it's certified, we could incorporate some portion of E and D into next year's budget, and say we're going to use this amount from E and D to to apply to an OPEB account or we're going to apply it to some type of construction. Um, once we ask to use E&D, 
that needs to go to the towns. Um, we, we vote and approve the use of the E&D here, and then the towns are notified of our intent to use E&D for whatever purpose it is that we ha have identified. And then the towns are given 45 days to determine whether or not they want to bring that to a town vote or if they want to just allow us to do that. So no action on the part of the towns is considered an approval. Um, and the usually what happens is we have a solid explanation for why we would be using the E&D and we explain to the towns the purpose of using E&D for this is so that it doesn't increase the assessment to the towns and the hope would be that everyone is approving of that. So my guess is we would we would present to the FinComs of both towns and I mean I no I, no oh no so we make they, I, so we make the we make we make the decisions and we in, and so we notify the board of select we write a letter to the board of selectmen they decide what they want to do if they want to pursue it they do their process whatever their process would be which could be shared we with FinCom. simply yeah which would <clears throat> probably be shared with income okay. but, but we, we simply notify what is like so so we don't have any conversations with fincom to get their support to on recommendations that legally there's no requirement so legally, to do but that but i would that certainly <laughs> I think it would depend I, what you're doing i would certainly well, if we're think using it for opeb is my question yeah, so, I think that would be, a, I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that would be a great topic of conversation for one of the joint town meetings. Mm -hmm. Just to get a sense of whether or not they would be approving of that. So I can actually confirm prior to whether or not mm -hmm. we would be able to use the E&D to start funding an OPEB. I also, again, um, this as Ron was going to explain, this has been a rolling addition to this account. So I would not suggest entirely depleting it in any in any sense of the term. I just yeah. agree. <laughs> just start somewhere. Just start think. something. Absolutely. Thank you for clarification. Sorry. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Good. We like the little notes on the side. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's a good touch. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Appreciate it. And I think at this point I will pass the meeting back over okay. to our chair, Ms. Reggio. So where did we? The only thing we that we no skipped. No business stuff, right? Yeah. The yeah. only thing we skipped was that. We have two things of the minutes, though, don't we? No, we skipped both in here. Only the 26th is in the folder. Yep, just the 26th. So we'll be fine. Okay. She sent us the 19th. Okay. We did have two in the email. <coughs> yeah. Uh, at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve consent agenda A. So moved. Second. It's been moved. Oh, I need to abstain from the minutes. I'm sorry. I wasn't there. That's okay. You actually don't have to abstain. Okay. Then I won't abstain. <laughs> if you agree that they're good, then we're good. Okay. I mean, you can abstain in the vote if you so choose, but you don't have to abstain from voting. Gotcha. What if you abstain from voting? What? No. She so here's the thing. Voting. So let me, I'm going to do a five minute Robert's Rule, or maybe a three minute Robert's <laughs> Rules of Order. You need a quorum to run a meeting and take an official vote. You do not need a quorum of people voting. So the vote, if somebody abstains in a vote, there's five people, let's say, and the vote is two to two and somebody abstains, the vote doesn't pass. Let's say you have six people, though, and the vote is, is four to two or three to two and somebody abstains. So three to two, somebody abstains, the, the motion passes. You needed a quorum to take that vote. You don't need a quorum of people voting. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Does that make sense? You're, you're so, the chair. So, There's a reason you're the chair. No, so, <laughs> so we've been so trying I have to a, clarify this I have with a, when it comes to minutes because we keep putting minutes off because people weren't there. But you can, you can actually read the minutes. You can abstain from voting on them. But you only need a quorum. There are certain votes based on our policy where we require a percentage of, 
of the total membership to pass the vote. Then it's important. Then, you know, we need, well, the two-thirds would be six, right? <coughs> or whatever it would be. So then we would need six people to actually vote in the affirmative to pass something if that's in our policy that requires that. Other than that, you just need a simple majority of people casting a vote. An abstention is not a vote. An abstention can't help a vote or hurt a vote. So if somebody abstains from a vote, it doesn't negate the vote or help the vote. It's just of the people voting, did a majority of them vote yes or vote no? So if two said yes, two said no, it doesn't it go. It doesn't anywhere. go. Right. Okay. I think, the, I think the confusion is if you're not at the meeting, we've been abstaining from the minutes that we weren't at. That's right, but we've been also them. abstaining from taking a vote because people weren't there and we felt we didn't have a quorum and we don't need that. We just need a quorum at the meeting to take the vote. So if you weren't at that meeting, you, you can may still, still abstain. But you can still vote for those notes? You can. Okay. Actually, that yeah. was that I've always been yeah. confused by that one. Yeah. Right. So piece. we we sought clarification. We we have clarification. <laughs> and we wasn't there. I wouldn't want to vote on that unless I watched it. But the it's meeting. a package. So, and if you watch the well, meeting, and, and the you notes, read the you notes. can see the yeah. notes. Yeah. So you're approving what you Yeah. what you're seeing. Read and yeah. So So there's I'm a motion on the floor. I'm going to sign it anyway because I'm the secretary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any right. discussion? Not? <laughs> yes. No. All yes. those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions. Okay. Um, is it to you? It is to it me. It's to you. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. <coughs> um, before we uh, launch into our first um, of two presentations for our uh, new school improvement plans and professional development plans. Um, I want to just take a moment and uh, send a very sincere thank you to our principals and to the staff at each one of these buildings. Um, what you have in your packets and what um, uh, the community will be able to review uh, this evening along with the meeting and then after the meeting, of course, when they're posted, uh, I think is a very different way of looking at school improvement. And uh, <coughs> A lot of time, effort, and energy went into creating plans that are not only thorough, uh, but truly do capture the essence of the work and the actual work that we're doing and that we will do. Um, and so uh, I just want to thank the principals and their teams for this. This was a, a huge community uh, effort in each one of the schools to really um, develop um, school improvement plans that are meaningful, that are going to be living and breathing documents that will be reviewed routinely. Um, at least three times uh, uh, this current school year as laid out in your in um, some parts four plans yep <laughs> and and some parts monthly and so um, you know I just I, I want to emphasize just how uh, different of approach we are taking to our school improvement work um, I've had the opportunity to meet with our teachers I think maybe I have two or three PLCs left to get to and in each one of my meetings with our staff uh, in every building we've talked a lot about the district blueprint for improvement. We've talked about the school improvement plans being directly plugged in to that district um, uh, blueprint for improvement. And we've talked a bit about how we are truly moving away from being a system of individual schools to a school system that has a common aligned purpose and focus behind the work. Um, and I will say that that was very clear in reading these mm -hmm. while they were lengthy. The fact that they were all formatted the same, the fact that they followed the same concept made them very easy to process and go through and take notes. And so I appreciate that effort, that it was real consistent. And so um, we're going to actually have the principals present together because as you uh, just stated, uh, Jane, you can see some common threads between mm -hmm. a lot of them, and we should. We are a school system. We are not a system of schools. So uh, in that true notion of being a district of one, um, we're going to actually have the elementary principals present together first, um, just for a few minutes, go over um, some, some really important information, some additional data that we haven't discussed, but is, of course, in your plan, talk a little bit about um, the similarities between the schools at the elementary level and the work they're doing together. Um, and then some of the nuances, some of the things that are a little bit different and unique to each one of the buildings because as we've talked about this with our staff, the work is contextual and every school is at a little bit of a different place in the evolution of their work and practice with this. Um, and then we'll, of course we'll have tons of time for questions. Um, 
then we'll actually ask the secondary principals to uh, present together because, as you know, uh, we, have, we have been really striving to take a very tight, aligned 6 through 12 approach uh, with our secondary uh, teaching and learning and expectations um, through all of this work. So um, uh, Mr. Dudek and Ms. Kurt will actually do this very <coughs> similar um, uh, discussion with the committee in the community around the work that uh, we have in front of us. So with that, if uh, Dr. Remka and Ms. Schaefer want to join us up front and discuss our elementary plans. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. So we've been working really closely together this year to kind of make sure that we're very tight with everything we're doing. So we also found a lot of things as we were working on our improvement plan separately with our ILT teams that a lot of them did align with what we were doing. So then we kind of made sure we had similar wording. So that um, was good. So sure. So um, the fir first part is the data. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm not a good partner. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's our data. Um, we want to just kind of briefly go over the data with you. I know Dr. DeFalco went in in depth last meeting um, to go over each school data. Um, you notice at the complex, we um, decrease in all grade level for math and an increase grade, uh, grade three in ELA. When I say decrease in math is the proficiency. Um, you know, meeting or exceeding uh, the standards. But one thing I want to emphasize is our grade five math, even though the uh, proficiency decreased, but the SGP, the growth remained the same. And with the ELA grade five, uh, proficiency decreased, but the growth went from 46 SGP to 59. That's a huge growth for the fifth grade ELA. Um, in science, grade five student met and exceeded expectations about 58%. And after looking at all the data, um, I s spent a lot of time looking at each item and I decided to look at the items. Any items that we have less than 50% student score, uh, the correct answer, I would look at the description of the item and the standards. And then um, Dr. Falco said it was a lot <laughs> to look at, and we decided to look at all those items and, you know, kind of emphasize on a few uh, areas that we struggle with. And with ELA is text uh, features, finding evidence to support point of view, inf infer um, inferring uh, about characters and word meanings. Uh, like multiple meanings of a word. In math, our students struggle with equivalent, fractions. Mm -hmm. Geometry is really like drawing, uh, drawing, identifying lines and angles. Uh, word problem is a huge problem because our kids are not writing enough. And uh, that's also affect constructive response in the math. Um, and for Millville, we actually um, increased <coughs> in all grade levels for math. Um, and in ELA, we increased in grades three and grades five. Uh, in science, the, the, the grade five students were at 31% last year and increased up to 58%. And it's actually funny because we're looking mm, at the numbers same. and they're exactly the same, 58% <laughs> in both schools. So um, we found that. And these are all, again, meeting and exceeding standards um, as well. And we did the same. We looked at actually um, the chart board, and uh, she shared that she looked at the differences between the state and the school. So anything that was eight percentage points or more, we looked at as a weakness for our school or an area of growth that we need. And then anything we looked at 10 percent, eight percent, sorry, eight percent or more was the strength, and then 10 percent or more was a weakness. Um, and then Below we, the state. So if, you ha if we had 8% or more higher than the state, state, it was a strength. And if it was 10% or more, mm -hmm. it was a weakness. Okay. Um, so we, again, narrowed it down, and we found some common themes. And it was nice. I actually worked. Mrs. Allard was one of the people on my team, and she's our reading specialist for those um, that don't know Mrs. Allard. And she, was, she tackled the ELA piece, and she was like, oh, my gosh, I've taught this. So we started figuring out, she's like, I need to start teaching it younger so that they're getting it for multiple years. So those are some things that we came up with. But for ELA, in all grades, um, we noticed students had difficulty with text features. Um, again, they had, we had inferencing just like 
um, the complex did with characters, and we also had issues with point of view. And in math, um, for all grade levels, students struggled with equivalence. So equivalence as um, in third grade was between there was two problems and it was between multiplication and division and they had to find so you had a division problem and you had to find the equivalent multiplication problem and then you had to select that to go with the um, answer as the answer um, there was also equivalent fractions as you notice fractions is the second thing um, fractions was across all grade level equivalent fractions um, adding fractions and then two numbers um, two whole numbers and getting fractions of the whole numbers so that was another piece um, as well as again we had word problems as another area of that we need improvement um, can I just ask a question of course okay um, so you, last year you were at 31 percent for science in mm -hmm. grade five and mm -hmm. you went up to 58 percent this year mm -hmm. um, is there something that you can contribute that that change um, I know so we talked a lot about the units that were developed and things developed. of that nature. So I'm just wondering if and there's something that you can. So one of the things that I'm thinking, I'm inferring that that happened. Um, I taught the grade four, so last year's grade five, with the new science standards mm -hmm. when I taught them in grade four. So um, so we were kind of muddy, going through the muddy waters of that. Mm -hmm. um, and we had Miss Carr, who was here prior to that, for those of you that remember her, she, um, her and I started tackling them two years ago. And um, it was muddy. Um, so they did have some exposure, and we did a lot more hands-on that, mm -hmm. that year. So they really got it. Like, you could see the carryover. And Mrs. Faulkner then picked it up, and she kept it going with the hands-on, and she made sure all those kids did a great, did, were constantly doing experiments and, you know, using as much interaction as mm -hmm. possible with their learning. Okay. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So for commonalities, um, the what? We have some things you'll see are the same or listed as a commonality, but we also listed them as differences because we're attacking them a little differently. So they're the same in some things, but different in some. So um, we're meeting regularly with grade level teams um, to make data informed decisions on our, for our curriculum and instruction. Um, we use PLC time, ILT time, sorry, professional um, learning community time, instructional leadership team time. Um, we look using our curriculum hours differently this year, our staff meeting times a little differently, and um, our BBST meetings, which were our student services meetings, we talk about students and how they're making progress. Um, we have in both schools an inconsistent use of the math program. So this year we've made it a goal to make sure that our students are using the program with fidelity, our teachers are, start, are using the program with fidelity, and we're constantly monitoring. Um, and I've actually started doing my observations in math. So those have been where I started doing my observations so that I could spend an extended time and, and um, make note for that for the staff. Um, and we're also making sure that we're consistently implementing the science once we get that going, which you'll notice the science curriculum is the next one. Um, and literacy this year is um, a focus for finding a program that is consistent for all grades. So we're just continuing to make sure that people are teaching the consistency so that it carries over from year to year. So the how, um, actually the instructional rounds should, be, should go first. Um, but we, you know, look at the data, we identify our, our focus areas and problem areas. Um, we want to target professional development for our staff. When we say professional de development, could be a large group of uh, um, professional development or could be coaching in class. Um, so we're going to implement instructional rounds in our school um, and also utilize uh, psychoeffective instruction. Uh, when Christina says she, you know, try to start her uh, observation early, I actually bought myself a rolling desk so I can actually <laughs> be in the classroom um, and, you know, kind of take care of other business, you know, at the same time. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Should I wait? No, go ahead. <laughs> um, so you shared that you were doing observations in math and, and the new science has been rolled out. Um, I'm curious because we are piloting and getting feedback from the literacy and ELA because there are quite a few standards here that students had difficulty with. What are you doing to support that in the mix of the transition of um, 
the programs? Um, I, we're definitely using um, STAR literacy, the reading component, and that breaks down standards, so you, we're using that as one benchmark. So, so are the teachers teaching with STARS? So the STAR, um, it's a, the assessment system. So they, when you take it, there's an instructional planning mm -hmm. report, and that actually prints out the standards that students are having difficulty with. And so that's what the teachers are using to teach these specific standards. So we have that as a resource. There's a custom, actually, piece, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But the STAR custom, you can go on. You click on a specific standard. So say it's um, inferring about characters. You can click on that, and there's actually worksheets on there. There's activities. There's videos. There's um, little website activities and you can you can also print those out and then you can assess them with those too so you can use those as lessons and you can use them as assessment pieces we also have curriculum mapping uh, for EOA so if you look at um, just give you an example uh, one of the grade level team asked me to purchase books mm -hmm. for them uh, for the student to read my question is okay if I look at a curriculum mapping ma mapping, mapping um, are you modeling you know that's my question so you you're reading the same book so if you look at the map the, the curriculum is really you supposed to model and then students choose their you know level book so their books their that you might have purchased that might yeah, involve okay. inferring or might involve right. mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. that, that was mm -hmm. my question thank you Whole so child. then the whole child, um, we are as a district from K to 12, we're implementing a new social emotional curriculum. Um, it's called Choose Love. And we have a, um, we, in the elementary level, we've identified weekly activities to go with. So we're started courage and there's weekly activities um, to go with courage. So the first one that was the week of Columbus Day was um, write the word courage and write words or draw pictures explain what courage means to you. So then I have a bulletin board at Millville for the, ca for the cafeteria so the kids can see all the stuff they're doing. A couple classes did it together, so they did like a word splash of what the word courage meant to them. Um, it was really neat to see the direction that it took this year. Um, and the kids are starting to use the words and the um, adjustment counselors are teaching the lessons to support that as well. So um, I saw that in one of the reports. Are all the schools using the same words? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same theme. Same. It's the same program. It actually goes infant toddler all the way to grade 12. So um, we're going to start some of it with the preschool at the at Millville, but definitely K through 12 have push in um, lessons with that. I, I read that. Can I just add one thing? I wanted to your question. Um, we had put aside. We knew that we didn't have a year to wait to close some of those mm -hmm. uh, instructional gaps that we have in literacy while we're researching and piloting to your to your point um, and we did um, the committee did approve a small amount of money to put aside for just any additional like uh, Dr. Rumka mentioned some some texts that the teachers wanted um, for this school year and mm -hmm. so I know that Jill has been working uh, with the building principals to identify those resources which ones are going to fit into an RTI model versus which ones teachers want to use in the classroom for mm -hmm. core instruction mm -hmm. so uh, we really appreciate the committee putting that mm -hmm. aside so we could do that. So and I, I think to. just in the meantime, I know when Tammy and Claire came here, I don't know, eight, Several, six, eight seven, years ago, yeah, seven, maybe like eight years ago, I mean, they have inferring units. They can be pulled back out. They have the book closet that has inferring books that I know Mrs. Bolan did a, an incredible job building, at least I can only speak for the um, AFM um, JFK. But I think in the meantime, we can use what we have, and I don't. I, I I do worry a little bit that, you know, because the data is showing such a number of you know text features, all of those, I know we have the materials resources for it. For we it. have yep. resources Absolutely. for it. Mm -hmm. So I think diving back into what we have right now um, would be extremely mm -hmm. beneficial. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yep. Until we, you know, hammer out the program that is going to be used. Absolutely. Um, and the last thing um, for the whole child was we're developing a um, common language for a safe and secure classroom. So one of the things that we put in our weekly newsletters to go with the first lessons were building a safe classroom environment. So it was introduced, welcoming the kids into the classroom every day, developing relationships with students so that you can kind of catch if there's something off, if they're having an emotional day or something going on. So that was, we're, we're going to build that safe and secure classroom environment. And with the community, um, we, we really try to reduce the chronic absentees. Is um, actually, we're going to discuss that later in the latest slide. Um, 
also want to create an effective, um, actually create effective systems of two-way communication. Um, I know Christina sent out bi-weekly. I sent out uh, weekly news. Yeah. Oh, families. Families. Family newsletter, mm -hmm. I send a weekly update to the parents and really want to inform parents not only what's upcoming events, also share what the children are learning in school. Um, I, I first started walking around, taking pictures and writing down what they're doing, but I started to ask teachers because they can't be in every classroom every day. So I asked teachers to share what they're doing and uh, they started to share with me. I'm sorry, clarification. I, it's a monthly newsletter that I have. So even though we are the same, we are school district, uh, we still, you know, have some differences. But uh, to show you that we actually a school district, I actually have a typo on this slide uh, <laughs> on the how I put them. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so the what, uh, we're planning lessons. When you go in to see a lesson, uh, we, we really look at is there an objective there, you know, is there a purpose? Do the kids know what they're learning and why they're learning that uh, based on the cur curriculum? And also planning ex uh, <coughs> instruction to target the needs of the, each student uh, based on data, not just MCAS, STAR, F um, FMP, and using biweekly uh, PLC meetings so teachers would come in with their um, for example topic assessments we lay out all the topic assessments and look at students what question are they struggling with and why and then we look back and to the instruction is it something that we miss or we need to reteach um, so utilize that time is, is that ideal no because it's only bi-weekly um, my hope is to spend some time um, this summer to look at the schedule again and see if we can come up with something, you know, teacher can meet weekly. On the how is um, instructional strategies. Um, currently we have our instructional strategies and some of the Blackstone parents know is steps, is state the problem, think of a solution, explore options, put into action and see if it works. If it doesn't work, we start all over again with that um, strategy. Um, also in, uh, implement instructional support to um, assist educator and help them to craft their instruction um, like the coaching. Develop and align instructional focus across all schools. You know, Christina and I talk a lot. We talk about our instructional focus. We talk about our stra the strategies that we're using. Um, also uh, develop building and classroom level leadership. You know, um, Ask, really looking at teachers, have, giving them opportunities to talk about their lesson, um, have the opportunity to observe each other's lesson, best practices, and that's um, the how. Can and I then just the jump whole on that one oh, thing, Jenny. I'm sorry, sure. just, uh, to add just that the piece about the building level leadership. I just I really like that they left that in there because there's so much that the principals are learning from each other. Mm -hmm. And so I just think I wanted to highlight that because mm -hmm. that's part of our blueprint and it's outlined as district building and teacher. And I really appreciate the fact that the principals left in that piece because there's so much peer learning that happens. So I just want to highlight that. We meet every week, um, at least one time. And we once talk, a week. We talk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I speak dial. I have one, one question. Um, there used to be RTI blocks. I don't know if there still is. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, will those be um, starting in terms of um, meeting students' needs where they are? Um, so the kids will be going to different classrooms and, and seeing um, different, I don't want to say levels, but meeting the needs of, you know, if a, if a group of students have trouble with point of view, they'll be working on point of view. Will that be starting soon or is so, it being implemented yeah. now? So we set, we look at, you know, MCAS and, and I identify all these areas and uh, I actually learned that from you that we report individual uh, detail report and I print them out and teachers are looking at them where they can group students to focus mm -hmm. on, you know, the area of need. Okay, because yeah. I knew that I knew a while a few years ago they were they were doing it on a regular basis and then it mm -hmm. kind of went away and then I wasn't sure where we were at with the RTI blocks and I know a lot of parents here even the kids will say I don't think they know what RTI means but mm -hmm. they know that they had RTI today so I'm just curious for the parents out there to be able to explain
explain, sure. you know, what that looks like and what it's going to look like moving forward. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because it's only half an hour, mm -hmm. you know, for kids to move around and you lose five minutes right there. Mm -hmm. um, we actually talk about it with Jill and uh, thinking about for next year, we can extend it longer, you know, like a full period, because you really need that, you know, at least 45 minutes mm -hmm. of time. Um, so the next part is well, the you whole need it if I'm sorry, but you need it if it's purposeful. Yeah, if it's right. just 45 sure. minutes of kids doing their homework or reading an extra book or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think it's, that was my question. Is, is you know, I'm, it's not. I'm wondering what what it looks like or what it will look like because if it a half hour of being purposeful and a half right. and 45 yeah. minutes of not, sure. you right. know, transition is a huge piece. You're probably going to get 15 minutes tops of you know, and if it's at the end of the day, how much are you really? Get it ha that, has so. to be driven by data. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Thank you. Any other questions? No. And Jill's here if anyone wants her to speak to the RTI. Yeah. Well, I think. <laughs> just FYI. Just, uh, she's sitting in the but, back smiling. But I don't, think, I don't think. I don't think. Yeah, I've noticed that too. Yeah. I know, res I know yeah. RTI is response to intervention, but you also have the well, other yeah. students who are on the right. other side of that. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so push. it's kind Correct. of like a. To say it's an RTI block, it really isn't an RTI block because it's, it's hitting the levels of all learners. I'm just wondering where that's. If it's going to be built in, I would hate to use RTI because it's it's, it's really like yeah. what I need now or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And is that going to be you know moving forward? Are we going to have something like that? Yes, we. Yeah. Yeah. The whole child um, chronic absent at the complex is really heartbreaking. Look at the numbers uh, in 2018: 8.6% chronic absent, and in 2000 this, last year it was 13.6. And then I look at the lowest performing students. We went from 8.9 2018 to 15.6 2019. As Dr. DeFalco mentioned a couple of meetings ago, we can't educate students when they're not here. And especially the lower performing students are not getting all the instruction and they, you know, they're absent. So um, I did send out weekly, you know, um, average attendance and send out, you know, literature about, you know, how important to be in school. I know one week I was a talk of a bus stop <laughs> that how did I send out something about absentee. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm gonna, going to keep sending it out because it's important. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if um, we could actually get the um, BIPO or, or um, the parents group on board to have a club of some sort in the morning um, to get the kids to want to be there. Um, you know, as kind of an incentive um, to show up. Um, we have I don't to know. be creative. We, do, we yeah. do have one in the we morning. We do have a, yeah. um, mm -hmm. Mr. Eisenberg does um, running, running, running I think style. they call it fitness club or something. AM fitness club is what the exact thing it's called. Um, but he does a lot of activity, like moving activities yeah. with them in the gym, and they start at 8:15. And they do activities for a half hour before school starts, and right. then so that goes for like. So it you know, so it also helps them. Right get ready to learn. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know my middle schooler makes me drop him off at like 705 <laughs> because he needs that exercise in the morning. And I know Bebo has put out, a, you know, raised a lot of money. Um, I, and I think reaching out to them would definitely be, you know, I mean, see if they have any ideas because you, you run some great programs and they do a lot of work for the schools. Yeah. And I think if, if it's absenteeism and we identify, you know, where the, where the biggest group of kids you know are struggling to get here if we can give them an incentive to get here and you know enroll BIPO or you know the parents group I think it might be successful at least drop that a little bit the percentage well and I think just the art sorry to no, no, you're good. <laughs> I think just um, some of the work we're doing, m trying to meet students where they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you come to school and the struggle is real every single day, you, they don't want to fight mm -hmm. the fight. And, and so if we're really getting to a point where we can meet them mm -hmm. and help them see success, mm -hmm. that's going to also reduce this um, chronic absenteeism when they feel that they're Excellent. part of something mm -hmm. and, and sure. that we care about where they are. I think that goes to a lot. Mm -hmm of the conversations I see and have with parents mm -hmm. as, um, as a teacher and a parent. Okay, I know Christina talked about Choose Love. Um, at the complex, we actually have adjustment counselors scheduled in classes to teach uh, the program. So all students are getting that in um, their guidance classes. Uh, we also want to implement PBIS. I think this is very important because we always focus on negative reinforcement. And how about the kids who behave? Mm -hmm. You know, they get nothing. And, and 
why bother to behave? You know, mm -hmm. just simple positive reinforcement. Like the other day, I spoke to a few boys. So you got, if you guys behave, you can have lunch with me on Friday. We can play Pokemon cards. <laughs> it was like, like they like different kids today. Mm -hmm. And the teachers came to me and say, oh, you know, this boy is really behaving today. And I just want you to know. And he's looking forward to having lunch and play cards with you. And I think we need to, you know, implement that into our school. We want the kids who choose to behave and do the right thing, be responsible. So this is something that we, and the Adjustment Council and I, are going to put that together, um, a PBIS initiative. Well, I think it's also building relationships with mm. kids, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that's what they yearn for. Yes. So I think doing that and having them looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. I know there's some teachers that do do that and have lunch and give up their lunch, mm -hmm. and I know as a parent I'm very appreciative um, of the relationship building that teachers do. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The last piece is the community. Um, again, it's kind of redundant what I said. We're sharing information with parents, right, and uh, with family, and not just sharing what they're learning. And it's also achievements. You know, be positive and <coughs> you know, all these part is positive information to family, and it's very encouraging. So um, for Millville. Um, as you'll notice in the school improvement plan, we have varied growth um, expectations because we thought it was a little unrealistic to get someone from um, a grade level from, you know, like 30% to 80%. So we varied it based upon where they were, and we used the multiple data points with MCAS. We used STAR, um, and we used Fontas and Pinnell. Um, so we used some of that to get the varied system that we hope to see for this year. Um, we have weekly PLC meetings. Um, in, because we have a smaller number of staff in our building, we have vertical as well as grade level. So, um, and we have the multi-grade classrooms. So we have, I have one PLC that's grade two, two, three, three, four. And then I have another one that's four, four, five, and five. And then I have K and one. And then um, pre-K meets together. So it's nice because they can see kind of what's coming in and what is gonna be expected of their kids. Um, so they have that time to discuss and see, oh, well, I'm having a problem with this. Well, I'm having a problem with this. Well, where are you teaching it? And they kind of start talking about that. Um, so we've been focusing on the most recent PLCs. Um, we've been focusing on the first two math assessments for the year. Um, and then this week we started looking at the STAR data, the BOY STAR data. Um, and we use this time to just discuss in one particular, um, the four, four, five, and five group. They actually are working um, with the three of them for an RTI model, and they have a project for the students that need that enrichment. They have some, a smaller group for the more struggling learners, and then an, for the students that are on grade level, they're just continuing to build the skills that they have. Um, so they really have took that under their wing this year. Has that started already? They started. Um, they started with math. They found that um, facts were a weakness. So the students that had it got to do a different project, so they actually were working on traveling. Actually, Dr. DeFalco was there for that. They were traveling to wherever they wanted, and they had to figure out like gas mileage, and they had to figure out all that stuff using multiplication, and they gave them algorithms to, to solve with it. Um, and they did that in the computer lab during the RTI time. Um, then we had, um, they had another student just literally just practicing basic facts, but it was fun. Like they were doing math facts and then moving one of them was minions across the ground for every time they got the math fact, right? They thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, and then they, the other group was doing another type of game with the math facts just to keep it going. Now they've moved on to writing because writing is another area of weakness. So they're in a nine week, they have three week segments and they're going to assess after each of those three weeks. And is, is your RTI block a half hour? Mm -hmm. Um, so for the how, our um, instructional strategy, so we are focusing, actually the entire district has problem solving as our general um, theme of our mm -hmm. instructional focus. And um, our actually is, is Mustang, and it's must understand steps to achieve new goals successfully. Um, and our first strategy that we're going to do, and it's actually academic and social emotional problem solving, so our first goal that we figured would be, um, a strategy that we figured would be easier would be mnemonics, and we're going to start that with math. So many teachers use a mnemonic for math, so cubes, cups, whatever it is. We want to have one that goes from K all the way up. 
So that way the kids, you're not teaching the strategy and then teaching them how to use the strategy. You've got the strategy down, now you just can use it. So we're hoping that they'll carry that over. So we've got math, we've got several, we're gonna bring it to the staff meeting. They're gonna read some um, literature about how it is important to use mnemonics in your teaching and how it can help the students and then we'll select the, the, the mnemonic that we like best for math. And then we'll do the same thing with ELA and writing after that. Um, and then we're going to engage the students in pushing them to, to persevere through the work they're doing instead of just giving up or the teacher jumping into helping. We want them to have that productive struggle so that they're productively working through and still trying. Um, for the whole child, um, our chronic absenteeism in 2018 was 7.8% and we jumped to 11.9%. So that's one thing that I'm um, really taking on this year um, and with the hopes to get that down. The target for this past year was, for 2019 was 5.7. So um, I'm realistic to jump down. I'm trying not to jump down to 5.7. I would love that if we did, but um, I figure 7.5% would be, so we'd still be under the 2018 number um, and still 4.3% um, reduction. And then um, our teachers, actually Mrs. Morrow, our school adjustment counselor, pushes into the classroom um, for a half hour lessons with the students and the teachers are actually in there with the instruction of the Choose Love curriculum. So they're being immersed in it as the kids are, so they're able to carry that language over into the classroom um, as it's being used. Um, for community, I've started in my October newsletter sharing um, attendance. So. Um, the first one was if your child is late 10 minutes every day from kindergarten through being a senior, they actually will miss 65 days of school if you tally up all that time. And then we did if you did miss 15 minutes, because some people are like, well, they're only 15 minutes late. Well, 15 minutes up from K to 12 is actually 97.5 days of school. So um, it's a lot when you think about how much school you're missing half of a school year if you miss mm -hmm. 15 minutes every day, more than half. Um, and we're starting with the new attendance policy. Um, we're starting meeting with parents that are, um, of the students that are having the difficulty with getting the tardies and the absences. So those meetings have started um, in Millville. Um, we also wanna celebrate staff, students, and family achievements. Um, and then MESPA, our parents organization, has um, regular events and we have staff at them. Tomorrow is actually Halloween. So we will be, um, the students will be going around the first floor of the school and trick-or-treating. Um, and we have actually, um, Jake was just confirming with me, we have about 15 high school kids coming from Stucco and NHS, maybe 20. Um, and staff decorate the doors, and so if they can't help with handing out candy at night, they at least decorate their doors um, and are super excited about that. Um, and then we actually have some senior citizens coming in to hand out candy this year, and um, it's going to be really exciting. That would be me. I'm a senior. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we'll also have a holiday event coming up in December and um, the ice cream social. And then com continue communication with families um, with the monthly newsletters. And um, our reading specialist last year at the end of the year kicked off the summer with a little reading um, event for families to teach parents how to read to their child and read with their child and quite how to ask them questions and all of that stuff. We had not as high of a turnout as we like. We're gonna hope this year when we do it at least once, we'll hopefully get another one in, but um, that's our hope is to teach parents the same strategies, how to read with your child, how to ask them questions, how to kind of gauge their understanding of the text they're reading. And then using some of those um, things that we're weaker in and we need to improve, reinforcing those. And we actually had teachers come in and do that last year as well. So the last part is the professional development plan. Um, our teacher received training in Envision 2.0. Um, one thing uh, I wanna kinda um, stress is our K teacher in the past was using a different version, but this year we um, align everyone so they receive the training so they're using the same version of Envision. <laughs> um, they also, new staff were trained in uh, empowering writers in expository and all staff were trained in narrative writing. Um, also, we also train in the science program. They are implementing the first unit right now. Um, and we've also received STAR 
training. So all early literacy is going to roll out this year in K and 1. So we'll have data now from our kindergarten students through. Um, and we didn't have that always. We've had the Fountas and Pinnell assessment, but not the STAR data as well. And the early literacy actually tracks reading and math. Um, we, for those staff that wanted to deep, dive deeper into it, they, we did a STAR custom training mm -hmm. where they learned how to print some different reports, create different assessments, as well as find the strategies to help teach the kids. Um, and then we have Mayon that we were rolling out this year. Um, and we had webinars for that. And um, staff, we actually had the woman and we were able to ask questions. So staff were able to see how it worked and then we were able to ask questions and then we'll train the other staff during those times, during PLCs and staff meetings. And so, Mayon is? Oh, sorry. It's an online reading library. It goes with STAR and um, it's, a, it's a break off in, um, it is, so there's, I think, do you remember the Six exact? 6,000. 6,000, yeah. I was gonna say 6,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 6,000 yeah. books um, on there, and there's actually comprehension quizzes along with them as well if people wanna use those. And um, how can parents, can parents access that at home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's an electronic um, library. Mm -hmm. And they had access over the summer, so it should be the same username and password. Mm -hmm. And so when the parents <clears throat> receive this, and I'm just because we're, mm -hmm. we're live, um, when the parents receive this, did they receive it again when school started? No. So it so might be a good idea to out. send out send another um, reminder, reminder um, for that, yep. especially to get that use mm -hmm. um, up and rolling again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just have um, a question. Um, so um, in terms of communication, does the STAR assessment um, go home to students so families know um, where their child is at, or does it stay in the schools? So we just had a discussion during our PLCs mm -hmm. this week, um, and the teachers want to be able to explain the first one to the parents, so they're going to explain it at conferences, mm -hmm. and then they're going to send the report home with the parent that night. But they want to be able to explain how it's laid out, what everything means on the report, so that it's not ta-da, here you go, and if you don't know what it is, then mm -hmm. you're out of luck. So at least they'll have, they're gonna explain it and send it home. Mm -hmm. I, I just know as a parent, for me, seeing stuff come home is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their topic tests, you know, that's how you measure, you know, how well your child's doing. I mean, obviously their social, emotional well-being as well. Um, but so, you know, part of that is the communication. So mm -hmm. we do talk a lot about STARS. We've talked a lot about um, rolling it out and we, you know, it's kind of a conversation mm -hmm. we have here on a regular basis. So I think, you know, parents should know exactly what that looks like. Right. Um, so, um, and they can see the correlation too between when they get an MCAS or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just think it's really important to start mm -hmm. sharing that information with parents. Mm -hmm. And so just so parents know too, um, kindergarten is actually their windows from November 4th to the 22nd because we figured kindergarten would require a lot more hands-on. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna have the teachers actually take students, we're gonna have a sub in the classroom, have the teacher take students out like <coughs> two and three or four at a time and work with them to administer it because they're still new to all this. So they're gonna sit with them on the computers and just make sure they know how to maneuver the mouse and how to do all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece. So those are gonna be a little slower, a little more delayed than the, than the other students. All the other students have been tested from grades one through five already, so. And perhaps we can have a video of the explanation of STAR, one of Jason's famous videos. So sure. that you know, could be a, for the live people stream. who can't <laughs> live stream for <laughs> people who can't make it to sure. parent teacher mm -hmm. conferences mm -hmm. then yeah. like you said, I mean it, it may save you mm -hmm. guys a lot of uh, phone calls <laughs> and and et cetera of communication on on just those questions that you're mm -hmm. concerned that parents have so maybe just a link mm -hmm. yep. you're getting so good at it dr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lastly um, I know we have similar, you know, develop, uh, professional development plan, but the, the complex really want to focus on giving teacher opportunities to observe each other, best practices, really focusing on that coaching piece um, because we have nine new teachers at the complex and wanted to uh, give teachers the time to talk to their mentors, review their lessons, and have the mentor come in, observe them, and give feedback. So that's really one of our focuses. So all nine of them, though, do have a mentor? They do have a mentor, actually, except one that is brand new. Okay. So we're still looking for a mentor okay. for mm -hmm. And then for Millville, we're going to work on the um, identifying our instructional strategies as well um, and using research to find out what's best and why we're doing it. Um, and 
you know, the importance of moving it forward, to move our instruction forward. Um, and the other thing we've actually started this last, pe the curriculum hour, we mm -hmm. found um, professional development to continue our targeted PD for PE, music, yeah. um, art, and found different webinars for them. And they actually all said yeah, that it was fantastic. It. They loved having something to help with yeah. their personal growth and their professional growth. So. And they feel value because we are giving them something that pertain to their mm -hmm. teaching. And instead of having them sitting in a reading training, mm -hmm. you know, um, so they, they were very happy about that. Any questions? I think where can um, parents find these big school improvement plans? The, they're, the meaty. Yeah, they're going to be posted tomorrow. So we wanted to present them formally tonight. They'll right. So they'll tomorrow. be posted on the web on the school website. They'll be posted. Both the school's website and the district site. So okay. you can find them in two places. All right. Because I really think it's important for parents to click on the the big mm -hmm. school improvement sure. plan okay. for all the schools and really read through it. Um, because it does drive our instruction, and I think if parents have a question or they want to see something um, from their, ch mm -hmm. you know, from to see progress, I think um, they should ask questions mm -hmm. um, and not wait, not be reactive, but proactive. So I think these, the, I mean, you, everybody did a really good job, and I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a school improvement plan this descriptive. Um, so I applaud your efforts. Um, I just want parents to know where they need to go to look at it and really dive into it because um, it's a lot of work. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, has Wilson training started? Yes, it oh, started yeah. over the summer. Only because I um, I feel like that's part of the, the all of these plans, like for the, especially the students who are really struggling. Yeah, as yeah, it started. Um, to get closer. Yeah, it started over the summer. Wilson, they're progressing well. <coughs> right yeah. over the summer, they've already had their first general meeting, and all the students were approved weeks ago. Teachers are looking at it, and uh, our trainers are helping us in the major session. Thank you, Jill. So next we have our uh, dynamic duo, or at least one of them, <laughs> uh, Wonder Woman and uh, Mr. Dudek. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I think that's Clark Ken. Oh, is it Clark Clark? Yeah. <laughs> have you, do you see the t-shirt? You want to see it? A, if there's a phone booth nearby, we're oh. in trouble. I have a cape on somewhere. Th this will be explained um, in the presentation. <laughs> we had a meeting today, and I walked in, and I said, oh, you're here. I've I never know. seen that expression before. <laughs> and I said, oh, I've forgotten at this point that I have a cape on my back. Um, so it's, it goes along with the Choose Love that we kicked off today at the middle school, and I figured I would wear it tonight and show courage to all of our students <laughs> that I actually go to a professional meeting with a Wonder Woman shirt on and a cape. I've not ever worn a cape in my life before today, so. <laughs> and That's I've not even awesome. watched the Wonder Woman um, movie, but I figured this would be good to wear today. It's pretty awesome, you have to watch it. My cape's at the dry cleaning, so <laughs> sorry, you sorry. Use it so often. <laughs> so uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, having us today. Um, I just want to first start by um, just sharing that we set forth a really aggressive plan uh, yeah. because we all know that we need to move our students forward. Um, when reading the plan that you have in front of you, I'm hoping that you see that there's a, a sense of urgency in the work that we're looking to do. Um, we used the blueprint objectives, our data, the milestones, priorities to lay out um, all of our plans. So t t tonight, Tanya and I will summarize, uh, just like the middle school, uh, the elementary uh, principals did um, on the data, common themes, uh, milestones, and the PD plans for today. And I got that to work. <laughs> so. Um, in terms of our, our data key findings, um, I just wanted to share, I know mine is, is a little lengthy, uh, so I just wanted to identify some of the key words. So when you're looking at, we have our ELA writing standards, our math focus and our bio focus, but when you're looking at our ELA, you're seeing um, key words and statements like write arguments to support claims, uh, write information, uh, informative explanatory text to explain, convey complex ideas, analysis of content. Uh, writing narratives to develop experiences uh, in math, proving geometric theorems, understanding congruence in terms of rigid motions, seeing structure, solving problems, 
And then in our bio, which is a little, little more general, is topics of chem, of life, cell bio, and genetics. Um, overall, looking at the data, and there was a lot in there um, in, in the high school plan, um, students really struggled with closed reading and multi-step problems. Um, so in our ILT, when we looked at the data, we, we really thought about what could we do together as a school that was um, truly valued and um, everybody would be able to take on. So that focus of critical thinking and problem solving came to play. And it's great to see that the middle school uh, and elementary schools were all on the same page. Um, so the one thing I'm just reflecting on now, you know, I talked about some of the areas of focus, but when we think about our accountability data, I just wanted to highlight a few in terms of the positive gains. So um, we exceeded targets in our ELA achievement for all students. Um, in our science achievement, um, we exceeded that target in our high needs population. Um, so that to me was, was great, great things uh, happening there. In terms of our advanced coursework completions, um, the high school has that advanced coursework um, indicator, so we met that target. Uh, science achievement, we met that target, all students. Um, and then ELA growth, we had high growth in all uh, students, including our high needs students as well. Um, so those were some of the key findings that we found um, at the high school. For the middle school, um, I took, we took the data and we broke it down when I was working with my group of teachers. And we were looking more, we looked more at the standards, as Christine had said, what we did. So something new that Desi put on the school profile page is you could actually see every single test item question, as well as which standard and then where you fell either below or above the state average. Um, and so that, this is pretty much the summary of looking at that data. With all, all grades in ELA, with students having challenges of development of the point of view of more and more one characters in their writing. And then in grades seven and eight, with students having challenges of de idea development and conventions in their writing. The, and I, I was expecting to see, usually writing is where you need the most help. <clears throat> Um, and as Mike said, if you look at the MCAS data for ELA, for grade six, we had 7% um, of our students exceeding, 58% of the students were meeting. For grade seven, we had 15% were meeting, and 63% um, were uh, meeting, and grade eight, 40% were meeting, and 7% were exceeding. So we're still doing really well. There's just room to grow, especially within the writing. Um, and hopefully with seeing the empowering writers down at the elementary and then coming up with a literacy program that really intertwines the reading and the writing, because that's what the test is like for the middle school, that that will help us uh, moving forward. In all grades for math, students have challenges with the, with spe seem to be specifically with number sense and especially with fractions and mis mixed numbers. Um, and then the distributive property and linear expressions. So math teachers have already said uh, whole number problems are out the window because everything on those tests, it's all, it's all either in decimals or in fractions so that they get used to that because mm -hmm. the whole numbers are just too, a little too easy. Um, for grade science, for eighth, uh, eighth grade for science, students are having some challenges which really goes into some of the reading and the math with interpreting models and diagrams and then the mathematical portions of questions that are in the science. So for uh, commonalities, for the what, we have, um, Mike and I are both working on making sure that the implementation of our re revised science curriculum, for us it's more of rev a revision because we did have a science curriculum that the teachers have been working on and they've just worked to ensure that it's um, vertically aligned and that they have in place everything that they needed for that. Um, we also are part with the, since we're doing the K-12, the research literacy, literacy programs and piloting, and we're having discussions. So for middle school, being stuck in the middle, do we want to choose a pro core program that goes with K-8 because the students have spent six years down in elementary building these skills, or do we end up going with the program that's with the high school? Um, we haven't made that decision yet, but that's what in the middle school that we're trying to decide what we want to do. I have a question on that. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to the literacy program and piloting at the middle school, how does that roll out with um, humanities and then a reading teacher? 
that's what we're also wondering too. We haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> We've had one meeting so far with the people from ANET who are helping with us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when we were starting to look at the programs that they're more English based and mm -hmm. they're, I mean, you can use, so we have Newzella now and some other programs, but we don't have, we don't have much for history text. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have asked that this year we also look at the history standards, grade six to 12. We didn't want our history teachers are, you know, ready for it to look at those new standards, which are super aligned with the literacy standards. Um, they were rolled out a couple of years ago, but you're going to see all the informational standards, the language, the speaking, the listening, that's in the English standards are now in the his new history standards. So the piloting of those programs could be a reading teacher or it could be the humanities teacher or it could be both? Right. right. Okay. We, haven't, we haven't even finished deciding which programs we want to go with. Right now we're just at the point where we're reviewing different programs that have using ed reports came in at a high level of um, not just usability but having impact on student learning and then from there we're picking the top three and so all we've done so far is look online mm -hmm. at some of the stuff and the print materials are all coming here for us to look at the, when we have the November meeting. Mm -hmm. But if I could in the midst we're actually also developing the units of instruction with the humanities teachers in grade six so we actually started doing some partnering yeah. with um, uh, with an individual that is really dedicated a significant portion of her profession to just this piece of work. So we've actually contracted with her to do some work side by side with the sixth grade teachers to help make sure that they have everything they need in place with that. So, so far so good with. Yeah, they just had a whole, just started, they just had a whole day uh, Wednesday. That was yesterday, right? <laughs> so um, they just did that on Wednesday. I mean, and, that, and, that, and that was our high school English teachers as well, mm -hmm. looking at that pilot. Um, you know, there's some questions with 9-10 to have that aligned, and then we get into a lot of our electives at mm -hmm. in 11th and 12th grade. But mm -hmm. that's that's a conversation that they're having. But yes. it's, there's value behind that, and they're all excited to, to, to really look at some programs. Um, and then the next one is just a strengthening of the core curriculum for, through a formal re review cycle and narrowing the achievement gaps through intervention cycles. Um, for us, it's honing in on making it better. Um, I don't know if you want to speak for the high school for the intervention piece, but. Mm -hmm. So um, just from an intervention standpoint, we're finally really into our STAR uh, piece, so STAR ELA and math, and really looking at a data cycle to explore where our students are uh, scoring, um, what sort of data we really need to look at and target in terms of our reports, because there's a lot in, in STAR in terms of the reports of final, really looking at those reports that are going to be super useful for our teachers, um, identifying what standards students are missing um, or weekend, um, targeting that um, and looking at um, four to six week intervention cycles, um, and then really uh, just assessing and then evaluating where our kids are at. Um, so that, that's been a big part of looking at our achievement gaps, specifically at the high school um, and, and using the STAR assessment. But along with um, our MCAS data, um, we were able to find a, a lot of um, data on, on the state profile, honing in on specific questions and actually even seeing what the questions were from MCAS last year. Um, and, and being able to do a comparison there. So there's, there's a lot of targeted intervention that's beginning to happen um, at the high school level. And Mike, what period of time are you using for that? Like where are they, where, what are, what is, what's in their schedule that they're being so we So that, that's a conversation that we're having with Jill Pilagalrani in terms of, you know, do we look at an RTI block? Do we look at a period? We have looked at our Flex 20 block so that we have that 20 minute um, during our first period to really look at that, but it's also just honing in on the instructional practice within the school, like the period, to see if there's any ways that we could do differentiated instruction in terms of station rotation. So we're, we're still reviewing how that could look like, but we also did hire a, a new teacher who's doing business and marketing, and he's also, be, he's also uh, been identified to do math intervention with our, um, with our freshmen and our sophomores for, for, for math. Content. Can I just add to that, if that would be okay? Because to address part of your question, one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, we talk a lot about RTI, but we know if we don't strengthen the core instruction, you're going to get more of the need for RTI. RTI. The need for RTI, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we've been having a lot of discussions about, 
you know, working with our staff to build that reteach and the pre-teach right into your lesson. And so, for instance, we were in a math class recently, um, Mike and I, um, I think it was in a geometry class, <coughs> and the teacher was finished with some of that, um, you know, she did a little bit of modeling, they did some practice together, and she was releasing the lesson over to the kids for them to kind of practice on their own. And we saw quickly, they, the kids went into these different groups. And she pulled a couple of kids together. They all had their devices, and they had their, I think some had their texts on their devices, some had the books. Um, and she just started reteaching that concept to the kids that was in the current lesson while the other kids are working on different skills that they needed to. So I think it's really working with their staff to help them see, you know, they have an hour. And so, you know, you don't, every class period when you, if you're, if you're using that kind of gradual release model where you do some, you know, you're doing some of that modeling, some of that co-work, and then you turn the lesson over to the kids, that some of that time can be and should be some of that small group instruction right there. So looking at, for instance, the star data and, you know, for your freshman um, English, when they're in that core English class, you know, there's no reason that that teacher can't pull a small group of kids to reteach a particular, you know, concept or skill of the kids that they need. So we're working with the staff and helping them to, you know, look creatively at the time that they have. Or having that interventionist push in yes. during yep. that time so that he or she can can provide that support too. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned It's just that harder we at the high school level because no, you're it's, scheduled it's somewhere. It's really different. Yeah. And, it's definitely, and you're yep. getting a credit yeah. for the schedule for the class that you're scheduled in. So it, it gets a little funky. We were looking at that, the, exactly what <laughs> you're talking about school. for the math, with the mm -hmm. math intervention. Like mm -hmm. how do we, we were looking at the students, mm -hmm. where they're assigned, what his, the teacher's master schedule is, and then kind of, Mike's been kind of um, waiting for the data to come out to determine where and how to construct his schedule because of that, you know, do, do we push those, that teacher into that class that has those six kids that needs that reteach? And those areas that we do, you know, kind of a combo of push in and pull out and, yeah. And you sort of have to find that, especially different. if you're doing a cycle of four to six weeks because mm -hmm. your classes aren't running four to six weeks. No. You know, yeah. so, so, so that's where you have to get a little, a very creative at the high school level. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at how to create um, various sections to put students in. So when we're looking at STAR, we're, we're trying to almost create additional sections like so there are so, so scaled groups yeah. so that te that specific teacher that math intervention uh, teacher could go and target those area those students without looking through a whole class list to be able to do that I think it is a little little more difficult the high school to, to, to get my brain around you know RTI or intervention when you have students that have seven classes a day mm -hmm. some of them have electives there could be a directed study hall could be Mm -hmm. you know core classes and, and and how to fit that in is is something that we're we're mindful of and, and, and trying to get a getting a handle on yeah we just added we at my high school um, added an EL, ELA essentials which is virtually a, a reading writing uh, intervention period that connects with the English class and a numeracy mm -hmm. class that then is it's numeracy geometry if you're in geometry numeracy algebra one and so it's a it's a scheduled course but it doesn't allow you to then target those kids that met their goal in six weeks and move them out they're there for the semester mm -hmm. so it's yeah. a little more binding yeah and we use the term RTI loosely but it is it's a research-based model and it means something to be in tier three versus tier two mm -hmm. and how you get in and out of those tiers and what those tiers looks like you know look like in terms of you know five times 45 research is really clear if you're going to really close a significant instructional gap you need five times 45 of explicit instruction on a skill period so I think we're we're not near that for the record I think you know in any area but mm -hmm. but working toward it I think is what we're hearing but also you know what you're also seeing and hearing through our plans is just that relentless focus on core instruction that's one of the main levers that we continue to pull on mm -hmm. good just, luck Mike uh, thank you <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take any ideas that you have so um, in terms of the how and the commonality so you're hearing um, the instructional focus so the work that we've done with focus schools and our ILTs um, problem solving, critical thinking across the board, K-12, um, that's where we are in terms of uh, that focus. 
Um, the other piece that we're looking at is the implementation of two evidence, at least two evidence-based instructional strategies. So at the middle school, and uh, Tanya will be talking about it, um, in terms of how do we um, really target problem solving critical thinking, she's using a um, protocol called ACE, and then we're looking at annotation or integrating um, or interacting with the source. Um, and, it, and it's interesting because I, I'm hearing high school folks saying, hey, they're doing something at the middle school that might be useful for us. And I'm hearing the same thing with middle school to high school where they may be looking at annotation um, in, in, in the upcoming months. Um, and then finally, thinking about utilization of our planning, teaching, and learning coach. So that, that those are two new positions that we have, or three. Um, special Ed just received one. Um, to reassess and make shifts in the instruction um, through the use of our data-driven instructional decisions, looking at instructional rounds, and then review of student work protocols, which I know is, is aligned um, similarly with the elementary as well. So the next, I, we were in the audience when you had asked, but with the Choose Love program, and it is district-wide, um, but just before this last PD day, um, my building-based SEL team, social-emotional learning team, they worked to roll out on PD what we were going to do with Courage, but they were also communicating with the high school group, saying what were you guys going to do and actually change some of their slides to and use some of the stuff and vice versa. So we put that as a commonality because we're kind of doing the, the same thing with that. Um, and I, I'm going to save this outfit for the next portion on whole child. So. <laughs> <laughs> but just with the whole child, I mean, that's been a, an interesting um, dynamic because we started with an SEL, district SEL team across all, all buildings, and now we're doing building based, but we're still collaborating and saying, we're going to roll this out, we're going to do this together. And that's why you see the four themes and courage is, is across the board. Um, so and then finally, with our community, um, talking about uh, our learning team and developing a portrait of a graduate profile, which is something that we, we started, and that also includes uh, the middle school and elementary. Um, so we thought that was a, a commonality there. And then thinking about how do we educate and communicate our families about the instructional focus, and then engaging them in ways to support that, um, or support their son or daughter at home. Um, So the next part, we, instead of saying like middle school milestones, here's where we're a little different, we, we changed ours a little bit. So it's secondary milestones. This is something that middle school's working on as well as high school. And then Mike will speak a few more slides later about additional things that are just unique to the high school. Um, but really, when I was going to lay out what was different for the middle school, everything I was looking at, I'm like, well, Mike's doing this too. So we actually have a lot more commonalities than we do differences for the secondary level. Um, so for the what, we've been working on creating a plan to, of intervention to address the weaknesses for, through the use of the STAR data. I know that I was doing that pretty in depth last year during our PLC time with looking at it, learning how to use STAR custom, and we're still, still doing that as well as making sure that our science and our history teachers are also being able to access that data. Um, we even changed over, so instead of getting a, you know, here's what the student's grade level is, we can get the Lexile number, which then helps them to decide what Lexile number to pick with Newzella when they're giving articles through that. Um, establish and use a formalized PLC that looks at student work protocol, so, because we share the same instructional coach. So we're having Mr. Curran, you know, and with Focus Schools, what is the, and uh, student work, pr work protocol that we can all do the same so we're not the high school doesn't have one and we have a different one as well as the instructional let rounds when we start those we'll be looking for focus schools to kind of give us the same background and how to implement that and then rolling that out with the, the coach in both schools um, and then again we're also both reviewing piloting and selecting a new core ELA program um, and then th we would be implementing that in the fall of next year next. the fall coming not this fall <laughs> i just i have a question mm -hmm. um because i know you just talked about it for the high school but what does the in what would an intervention block look like in the middle school so it's similar to what tammy said is for the middle school we have intervention blocks it's kind of like a set schedule because we have we also have classes that we have to have students in is it so. separate from gem or is it gem 
No. Uh, so, Jem, what I've done, if, if it's like a rotation staff with Jem, what I've asked them to do is how can you insert English and math into your rotation a little bit more because those students have already had the curriculum that they had for their particular grade and they're seeing those students a second time. And we don't want them to get the exact same thing again. Mm -hmm. um, but I had put into the budget for this year and, you know, we were able to purchase that and we're grateful for that. We've been using Language Live. We had 40 seats for that, um, and that's a intervention la English pro language program. It's just for ELA, and it's um, computer-based as well as uh, textual-based, and there's text that they work in, and so the teacher works with one group with the text, and the te that comes with uh, consumables. <clears throat> the teacher's working with them as the students are doing a on an online portion, so that frees her up to work with the students for the textual piece. Um, and those students were put in there based on their star stores that we've had and the MCAS scores. So that's the gem that you're talking about? Yeah, it, I mean, I can't, I, yeah, I think it's still called that in the, th I, in I the don't, computer. I don't, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know if it was like a directed study where you go, where students can be. No, um, gem before I came here, they've had it. It's okay. always been called gem and it's called growth in, in English and math. Okay. So. Um, but they're using that language live. Yes. During that yes okay thank you Wendy I was hearing Jim I'm sorry like Jim and <laughs> language literacy <laughs> that, that's phenomenal stuff that's good um, so for math we've Jim also too. for math last year I had <laughs> for the math we had some extra title title one funds um, because I couldn't have I couldn't find someone and yep. so we did an after-school program with VMath <clears throat> um, it's a virtual math program but they're also consumables as well and it's the same it's similar to the language live where they have print materials they can work with but other students work online and you can give out the, the students are working at their particular level and what they need so thank you you're welcome um, for the how we had uh, evaluate and implement evidence-based instructional strategies and since we were both thinking problem solving critical thinking skills or ILT we wanted to start with something that the teachers were familiar with. So at the middle school level, we have, um, before me, they had used ACE before. Some teachers used ASE, some people used ACE. If you Google it, most likely you're going to see ACE, but that doesn't fit for everyone. So we decided as a school that we want to use ASE. Which means what? <laughs> answer, support, and that. So for most classes, it will be support, but for math, they're saying show your work, and then E for explain. With the C before, it was just cite, and that didn't work for math. So everybody in the building had A, C, E, and then math had A, S, E. So we said we need to all have the same. Common language. Um, and so we're starting to, to roll that out, and how can we have more writing? How does this now having access to Newzella, where can we be inserting? Uh, in the math PLCs this week, we were saying, okay, could we maybe do like an article of the month or article of, a w of the week? You have access to be able to see the students' lexile reading levels and your general topic of math, what are maybe some articles in there that they could read that's real world application of that math and then they're doing more reading um, with that. So all grade levels are using New ZLA? For secondary. 6 to 12, another commonality. <laughs> um, and we only ju we just started that and rolled that out um, the Friday PD day, and staff are already using it, up and running, using it right away. Um, and then the second practice is uh, annotation of a source. So we wanted to do something with annotation as well, and then speaking with the uh, our PLT coach with Mr. Curran, he said, well, the high school is doing annotation first because that's something they've been familiar with. And it was, we've been, we've been telling everyone more of annotation of a source so that it fits all subject areas because there is not a lot of writing in the, you know, art room or reading in the art room, but how could you annotate a piece of art? So how can you annotate a source? You're looking at a fine piece of art and what are some information and things that you can say about that art piece and actually you know, mark up a copy of that art. Mm. Um, so 
it's kind of it, so it's co it's common and not that we're starting with one and he's starting with one and then we're just pretty much going to flip flop <laughs> mm -hmm. and then learn from each other how did you roll it out at the high school what did you come up with um, departmental wise because each department's coming up with the way that they're wanting to roll that out um, and sharing that information with each other and we're we're calling it so annotation I think if you look up what annotation is it's that very traditional. We're circling, we're marking up texts, we're writing things in the margin, and we're thinking about how do we do this in, in, in media. So when we think about digital media literacy, I think somebody came up with the word of interaction with text or interaction with source, so that you're, you're essentially just trying to break something down to be able to understand it a little better. Um, so that, that's the way that we're looking at that. And we have internal measures, as Tanya was saying, that we would we'd have to do. Um, assess how students are doing with that um, and then the last one for how is the use of our planning and leading uh, teaching and lead, learning coach to lead shifts in instruction through the data driven instructional decisions the instructional rounds and the student work protocols that we had mentioned before um, the next piece we have is the, for the whole child piece this is where I'll give a little bit more information on my outfit tonight um, we were at the secondary level grades 6 to 12 we've been working on creating safe and supportive classrooms how do we build relationship with students greeting students at the door greeting students as they come in in the morning um, and and not just that but what are some activities or events that can be happening in our school that goes along with these um, so we're also working on the implementation of the choose love curriculum through whole school lessons on courage gratitude forgiveness and compassion and action so today at the middle school we took down we took all the students and we broke them down into small groups um, and so I, ha I had a group actually here in the media center and we said oh what if we all came in dressed as superheroes and the, the kids had no idea I had to make an announcement this morning because they thought they missed out on something <laughs> but we, we are like no you didn't Early we'll give Halloween. you a day to dress up as a superhero too but <laughs> we wanted to just surprise you for this kickoff event that we were doing about courage and we had um, information to them and um, so we, we also we have PBIS tickets that were under chargers care that we have actually revamped and renamed um, and it's all being pretty much driven through the SEL team that we have at our Stuco advisors because Mrs. Meganelli is a, one of the co-advisors with Mrs. Tasker on our student council, but she's also on the social emotional um, building based team, learning team we have. And so with those PBIS tickets, we've kicked off also if you're doing these six things that show, can show courage that if we find you doing that, we can give out these tickets and they're worth 25 cents in our school store. Um, so we just totally changed up the look and feel of the PBIS tickets. Um, and so after courage, we'll be moving on to gratitude, then there's forgiveness, and then compassion and action. And then just school-wide events. So as we're looking for school-wide events between now and December 6th is when we're going to kind of finish courage for this year. What are some events that we can do that will um, have things to do with the theme of courage? Through, through the com for the community through our instructional leadership team we're starting to have discussions what can, what do we do how can we educate families in the community about our instructional focuses what the two best practices are and ways that we can support them at home those conversations have kind of just started because we've been so focused on getting that first evidence-based practice off the ground and into the classrooms um, so that that's but that is what we're now going to start working on So um, in terms of additional milestones that are, that are somewhat unique to the high school, um, in terms of the what, so we're looking at reestablishing and strengthening. Um, again, I know that every school has a BBST, uh, but we're looking uh, at, at that uh, to really strengthen what that looks like at the high school. But we're also continuing to facilitate our accountability team. So um, this team is just comprised of administrators, guidance counselors, and we're looking at um, some of those those accountability measures when we're thinking about dropout rate, graduation rate, retention, attendance, um, uh, discipline. Those are really important pieces that we're looking at um, on a on a monthly basis and really trying to target 
um, those those barriers that um, that students are facing um, and really providing some um, case management support there um, the next piece is developing semester assessments to provide students an opportunity to uh, really authentically demonstrate their learning and we've spent a significant amount of time at our last PD day along with SEL to really think about what that looks like um, within our departments and uh, it, a lot of the departments are really shaping um, an assessment piece on really think about learning portfolios that are aligned to content standards, power standards, overarching themes. Um, another big piece that we're looking at from the what is to introduce a formal college and career readiness curriculum to students. So really having that with our three guidance count our three counselors, um, having something that's in place that's aligned. Um, and uh, we are excited to, or I'm excited to, to, to mention that we have a team um, heading over to a workshop. It's a three-day workshop, but it, the, the first one is on October 30th, and it's put on by, by DESE on identifying what that college and career readiness um, curriculum could look like. And there's some area districts that went through that last year, and they felt that it was really beneficial, so that will help us um, in the guidance department. Um, the other piece is expanding just learning opportunities. Um, we have a manufacturing pipeline that the superintendents um, uh, were able to plan and put together. So we do have um, five students that um, out of a cohort, I think of 18. So we have a, a large number of students that are in there that are part of the Blackstone Valley Ed Foundation uh, Learning Hub um, and are in that manufacturing pipeline and they're, um, they're meeting on Tuesday nights um, off campus and um, the hope is that we can create uh, a sequence of courses for them to be able to, to receive an endorsement or some sort of certification in manufacturing um, and then finally we're looking at project lead the way um, we are um, going to apply um, for grants in uh, up in the next few weeks uh, to see how we can go and, and bed project lead the way um, within our within our school um, looking at the how, um, this is another piece that we're going to be looking at is applying um, and piloting the Kaleidoscope Collective of Learning grants and this is through the Department of Ed and this is really an opportunity, this is um, a district's measure, um, but really an opportunity to try new approaches uh, to teaching and learning and having some funding behind that and resources. Um, I know Dr. DeFalco has um, been um, applying and, and getting that, that out there for us. Um, and then finally, I know it's a repeat, but we really need to think about how do we refi review and define authentic <coughs> assessment measures that can be fully implemented in the daily curriculum. So I know this is something that was mentioned prior is, um, you know, if we're looking at semester assessments or authentic assessments, we also need to go and think about how that's aligned throughout the school year and really measuring what students uh, need to know that are aligned uh, to standards, uh, but it's also giving them a, a little uh, agency behind that. Um, the next piece is the whole child. Um, so we're looking at accountability meetings, which I mentioned earlier, um, to provide some case management for our tier two and three supports, uh, again, around discipline, attendance, and graduation rates. And just looking at preliminary data, it seems like th those accountability meetings have been um, of value and have helped us build a, a system and structure to really reduce that by targeting um, that data those data pieces um, another piece that I'm looking at with our counselors is to research and pilot uh, evidence-based intervention and therapy strategies um, to to practice dialectical and cognitive behavior therapy skills with students so DBT and CBT and essentially what we're looking to do here is is having students be able to learn more about the challenges that they experience and then thinking about the skills that they need to help manage their challenges on their own. Um, and to be a little more specific, because I know some people are, are asking me what's CBT and DBT. <laughs> um, and we're, we're going through that process with our counselors. Um, CBT is more short term. So thinking about um, how do we teach our kids um, how their thoughts and their feelings and their behaviors influences um, each other. And then when we think about DBT, we're really thinking about um, extreme, like coping with extreme and unstable emotions, so focusing on the, the, the emotional social aspects. And I think that would, that would really um, strengthen um, that piece of, of the work that uh, our counselors are doing. 
Um, and then finally looking at the community, um, we're looking at, uh, and this is always a topic of conversation, is how do we share and plan high school academic and extracurriculars offerings to our elementary and middle school parents and students? What can we do um, to open up our building um, and open up our school so that people know what we, we are doing? Um, and that's something that we're exploring with the ILT, with administrators, talking with the other ministers in the building, looking at our parents and any ideas that uh, people have in terms of the events so that we could share and showcase what we're doing um, at the high school. Um, we also want to review, identify, extend on um, learning opportunities for our students. So monitoring how our students are doing within the manufacturing pipeline and that cohort of students, and then also pursuing Project Lead the Way. Um, and then finally, uh, really strengthening partnerships with um, stakeholders to increase college and career readiness opportunities for students. So at the end of the day, when students are graduating with a diploma, we're looking for them to have that and behind that. Um, so uh, building those partnerships is, are going to be really important. Um, so those are the, the unique aspects um, to the high school. Uh, and finally, uh, we're just going to briefly talk about the PD plans, which are, they were, we don't have them here, um, but there are a lot of similarities with the elementary school, but we would just share out a few that we have at the middle and high. So for the middle and high school, we're working to align curriculum that embeds well-defined learning outcomes with a focus on the depth of knowledge, problem solving, and critical thinking with our, our evidence-based practices. Continuing to embed the SEL curriculum through the Choose Love, so each, each time we come to a new topic, we're making sure that the teachers know what to do and we're ready to roll that out. And in implementing of the student, looking at student work protocol and instructional rounds so that we can be making it, in, uh, informing our instructional decisions around that. And then just finally at the high school, just um, adding to that PD, we're thinking about how do we increase student agency through um, formal authentic assessments aligned to standards, um, and then thinking about how do we implement college and career readiness curriculum um, within, within our students, our school, and, and the counselors that we have um, on board. Any questions? It's a lot of information. Yeah, it is <laughs> a lot. That's not nearly a lot that's all Interesting that Desi would hold uh, uh, some kind of professional thing for school counselors two days before a November 1st deadline. So mm -hmm. just saying, oh, not great it's, planning. It's, it's timely. <laughs> it's timely. And As a senior parent, I see that deadline and I think, I better call Peter tomorrow. <laughs> and again, I'm not saying that there isn't anything happening, but we just want to truly formalize and have that sink, sink sure. in. Um, you know, we, we are using curriculum but it, but again we want something that's aligned and, and it's it's research based and, um, and we know that it's happening um, I think you said October 30th was the day they were going to some training yep no yeah and I'm, I'm included in that they want principals teachers they want teachers just, okay. just the non counselors and we have both two counselors going so there's a team of four nice. we have one October 30th and then I think mm -hmm. there's another one in February and then another one in April um, and it's it's across this, the, the 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 state. Great. Yeah. I bet we'll see that at MAS. Ti timely. Timely. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Thank you. As you can Thanks see, guys. a lot of work going on in terms yeah, of. Yeah. Ooh. Thank you. Have a good night. Nice work. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. What is this going on here? <coughs> that includes my that report. That was you. All right. Uh, Mr. Aaronworth, I think you're up again. Excellent. I can move into a meeting before the meeting. <laughs> Update on all things facility related. Um, regarding the complex project, the uh, JFK AFM windows and boiler, uh, gymnasium windows were put in during the uh, Columbus Day weekend, and everything is still scheduled to be completed by November 12th. The boilers are up and running, and uh, there was a small glitch in the computer control systems with them, but they're fixing that. Um, they, they found that today. They're fixing it, and there's going to be training next week for all of the custodians and myself on how to manage the system. Paving at the complex 
has still not been established when that's going to happen, but Dr. DeFalco and myself are meeting with both Dan Keyes and Dan Keefe on the 28th, and we will make that a point of conversation. The elementary boiler, um, the project funding agreement was accepted and approved by the MSBA, so as far as they're concerned, we're ready to move ahead. We just need approval from the town's people of Millville to move forward with the funding. Um, there was a delay in, they realized that they couldn't have the election, the, the ballot election, so shortly after the town meeting, so it needs to be moved to December 4th. And I'm currently in the process of asking for a slightly longer extension from MSBA. The high school fire system, which I know has been a long and grueling project for many of the people at this table, is essentially done. Uh, and we are hoping to test the fire system on Veterans Day weekend uh, during that Monday when the kids are not there. I'm waiting to f get a uh, confirmation that that will work for the fire department and for the alarm testing company. But everything is in place, the system is up, and they believe that it's running well. Phone systems, every one of the old copper lines has been shut down and we haven't had any concerns or complaints <laughs> and the alarm systems are still in place as are the elevator lines and all of those emergency needed uh, lines of communication. I, I am laughing because it's been really hilarious watching people try to transfer calls because it's a new system. So trying to more people have hung up on trying to move them from one phone to another. Yeah. We're figuring it out. We're That's getting okay. it. Yeah. Well, I, there is one thing that we're still we're working it. on, which is apparently <laughs> Verizon said we can't cancel our voicemail lines, but we're working with them to find out, A, if we need to pay for those voicemail lines, and B, what impact does that have? I do wonder if that means that sometimes when people are calling the old numbers, they yeah. think they might be yeah. leaving a message that nobody is accessing. Oh. So once we get some further clarification on that, we'll make sure that everyone is aware of mm -hmm. all of the new systems, the lines, and um, if you get a strange voicemail that doesn't sound like it's connected to the district, just don't leave any message. <laughs> <laughs> the security systems the security systems have been all installed um, they they um, were able to work at Millville I believe the last couple of days and connect the intercom system to the two sets of doors they are still waiting for some equipment at JFK to make sure that the two sets of doors are operable with the intercom system so that the interior can buzz both sets um, but as far as I know, everything else is up and running. Right now, we just need to identify who is going to have access to view all of the, the remote cameras. Um, I've sent the company a list, and I have to tell you, it's really pretty awesome. I, I wrote the SRO officer. Uh, I was at the high school the other day, and Dave pulled up all the cameras on his phone, and wow. you could see everything that was wow. going on in the high school building right from his phone. It was very impressive. That's cool. Last we spoke, the, the hot water heater was not installed at JFK as was required by our insurance company, and it has been. So that project is done. The roof, which has also been <laughs> a long standing concern of ours, um, I have. Second uh, career. Last, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into roofing, I think, after this. <laughs> <laughs> or walking in fields. Well, I'll, hire, I'll hire you to fix <laughs> the roof. Yeah. The, uh, so the as snakes MS in the woods. As, MSB, as MSBA <laughs> referenced last time, um, they wanted us to reach out back to the manufacturer. I've been in touch with Sarnafil, who's the manufacturer. They have been out to the roof to inspect all of the conditions. They've identified that some of the work belongs to them as under the warranty, but they've also said that there are pieces regarding the anchoring system where a cable snapped and then the cable caused damage to the roofing that that's not under warranty so we are working with the insurance company uh, both Dr. DeFalco and I have a meeting set up with again Dan Keyes and, and Dan Keefe to discuss how we want to move forward I've had some assessments scheduled I believe one was coming in today and one is coming in tomorrow to go onto the roof 
and look at what the costs might be to remove the existing damaged anchoring system and replace it with a new anchor system that wouldn't have cables because the cables tend to capture the snow bit the snow weight and then the cables snap so we're looking at alternative options but i'll discuss those further so there's there's a big meeting with the town on what the 28th, the 28th. for the for the big, for the, big joint yeah, I mean, it's an old building. It's a very old building, and I, I can't even recall the last time it, there was paving that even took place there. And the roof, I'm hoping this roof gets done before the winter, because if we have a rough winter, I'm, I'm concerned about what's going to come of that roof. The complexity of it is, of course, there was a lot of this from yeah, everybody, yeah. right? And I don't mean in the town. I just mean the different people, in general, the yeah, vendors right. and such right. that were involved. Right. but. So it was really like just this relentless effort of trying to tease out mm -hmm. who is responsible for what. And I Where's actually think we're at a place line? now where we've got that. We've, yeah. we've like we know who has to fix what and we have all the yeah. research behind it. And this actually traces back to a winter storm, I believe, that so was five, six years ago. That's 15, yeah, it was, was, it was yeah. 2015. It was 15. I, think. Yeah. I would just love to put some of that to rest for the both of you so that we can focus on educating <laughs> children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't take our eyes off that. We either. don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know that, but I mean, it's it's just yeah. been it's yeah. been continuous, and, and it's yeah. just it would be nice to have it done. Yeah. Have it done. Um, I'm sure many people are aware of the small snafu we ran into with the well at the Millville Elementary School. Um, that was very uh, untimely. However, the pump in the well has been replaced as, as well as some of the piping that goes down into the well. And currently I've been uh, contacting bulk distributors of potable water to make contingency plans in the event that we have any other issues moving forward. So um, trying to put everything in place so that we don't ever have to cancel school again. Right. Ever. For that. Because there's for no anything. water. Yeah. <laughs> nope, ever for anything. <laughs> Good luck. Well, we also have had questions from families about how then that for one school versus a district is made up. And so at some point, we need to address that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because the day will have that. to be made up. <laughs> what? I was just going to ask yeah. that. We, we, yeah, you actually, in up. Franklin, we had yeah. two years of sprinklers bursting in two days. And our particular school had to make up at the end of the year, yeah. two days when the rest of the town was, was out. already out. Yeah. I think didn't we do that? Didn't the complex have to go an extra day versus the rest of the district? I heard. Yeah, I think that they that went. Did, they took a vacate. They took a spring break. Yeah. They did it, it's, that it's, it's definitely it a conversation of, yeah, of we, what's we best, and, and not everybody's going to be happy. So <laughs> yeah. you could just lay that out there right, it's right now. <laughs> the principals are pointing at right each other right now. I think <laughs> laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. Our school was laughed at for the six months. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was it was tough. That last day was tough. <laughs> it was fun, though. but I, you we know, people need to know now that that's yeah. not a day that you just no, had a lovely appears. snow day. It's no, and the, and the state gives us yeah. out, so many hours that we right. have to be in school. So yep. it's not something that we can just say, oh, we're going to go without. Okay. Like we have to cover the It'll hours. One hundred eighty days. Yeah. In one hundred eighty days, so yep. it has to be made up. One hundred hours, yeah. one way or another. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, that concludes my facilities report, unless there are. <clears throat> is there anything else from the common good? Anyone have anything? <coughs> um, do you remember? I, this is just really quick, but um, you had put out an email one time that says um, who to contact if yes. there was a concern. Is there a way you can put something very similar out with the plans on it and, and send it to people so that everybody has? Here it is, um, the school improvement plans, like a, just a link. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. But we could do a um, one call email with a link to each school improvement. I, I think that would yeah. be really important. That's that's fine. It'll be at their fingertips. Right, they'll be posted on the website. Yep. And, and they'll just yeah. link it right. Right. To the website. Right. Yeah. Just an easier way to access um, the documents. Um, and Absolutely. I do applaud, you know, the the teams for working really hard on this. Okay. And a shout out to the teachers that are on each. I mean, yeah, the they're all. In the, I mean, in each one of those initiatives, that mm -hmm. like you can see the team of people behind this work, mm -hmm. which that's how it happens, mm -hmm. right? Not just the development, but the implementation. Mm -hmm. So, amazing work. Okay. 
No one. All right. Our next meeting is November 14th. Uh, we also are likely to confirm within the next day or two a joint meeting of the town's uh, boards of selectmen, finance committee, and school committee for November 12th. So if you can all get that on your calendar as well, that looks like a good date. Not everyone can make it, but it was a good majority of response, so we'll be confirming that mm -hmm. um, very shortly. Will that be televised? Have they been in the past? Mm -mm. I don't think they so have been no, in the no. past. No. I think so. one, one was. Well, I think the mm -hmm. one that happened on this side was. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The first one, maybe. The first one wasn't. But I think the second one. But was. they do need to be posted for every every board that has. Believe they'll have a somebody forum. Somebody was on the phone. So we'll be getting information out about that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to um, remind folks, uh, just public in general is our meetings are all posted on our website. Our agendas are posted on our website, and that is our official posting. Whether or not it gets posted at a town hall or a town site um, is something that is secondary, but according to our policy, our policy is to post on the website. That's our official posting. So we'll send that out to everybody to remind them of that as well. But if you want to know if there's a school committee meeting, um, it's there. If we make, a, if we call a special meeting, um, that is not in our general announced meetings or if we dramatically change an agenda then we post it to both towns within 48 hours of, of the meeting but general meetings are posted on our website um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session and not to return we'll adjourn the official meeting in executive session I moved is there a second second you roll call when yeah. yes 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 yes, yes. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you sorry they were under by folded back